There we go. All right. So the first question I have before we get into anything is, does anyone know what the term Swifty means? Have you ever heard the term Swifty or like Swifty code before? Anybody? Does anyone want to take like, a stab at what it is? Like to make it faster, like make it to where it's, what's the word I'm looking for? Not efficient, but like that way you don't have to do a bunch of steps. Like it just kind of does it. Yes. Okay. So that's a great way to describe it. So Swift, the language in and of itself, and you guys will get into Objective-C later and you'll see how awesome Swift is. Cause like being born into Swift is a dream because you're going to go and learn Objective-C and there's a lot of like, uh, I, for you, it will seem like silliness at first. Just like, why would we have to do this? We don't have to do it in Swift. Swift is one, an easy to use language. Two, it's convenient. There's a lot of like conveniences to it, properties and things that help make your life easier. And three, it's safe. It's a very, very safe, pretty easy to use language. It's hard to like force crashes and problems to happen the way that Swift is set up. So the, like Cece said, Swifty, writing Swifty code kind of encapsulates what she said of making your code performant and efficient, but limit the amount that you have to write. So make it a goal from now on to write Swifty code. And what I mean by that is try to make the most performant things happen in the fewest amount of lines. So write little amounts of code to accomplish something. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do higher order functions, which they're usually particular to like arrays or dictionaries, but they're extremely useful. You're going to use them all the time. But these four specific functions are going to keep you from having to write lines and lines of code and for loops and while loops. They're going to do it for you in one line of code, maybe two, but like it'll be super efficient. It's just the matter of kind of learning the syntax of the way that these functions are made. And that's what we're going to cover tonight. So I'm going to show you like the long ways to write things and then how to even shorten them down. So you can even write um, fewer amounts of code in one line and with fewer characters in it. And so like now that I'm looking for jobs, I just finished an interview a week ago with a coding challenge. And the main thing that they were looking for is one that I could solve the solution, which I didn't, it was a mess. But two, they want you to write few, like few lines of code, as few as possible. And that's the beauty of Swift is that we've been provided with a lot of convenience functions and methods to help you write less code. And so your employers are gonna see that and say like, he's more efficient than the next guy or the next girl, CC, because they can write things faster or they can write things quicker. And so from now on, make it a goal to write Swifty code. And you'll kind of have your own definitions of that going forward here. But we're going to play around with these things a little bit. And before you know it, you'll be really good at all four of these methods and you'll be able to use them in real project situations all the time. Okay. Um, let's start here. So I've kind of laid out a couple of arrays so you guys don't have to go in and start typing in data sources. We're just going to use the ones that I've kind of pre-programmed for you. So the first one we're going to talk about is sorted. So what I'm going to do first is in order to access this method, we're going to have to call the array that we want to get into or modify. And then I'm going to go down and start typing sorted. And the first thing that we're going to do for each of these is that I'm going to kind of read the tiny documentation for them. So sorted returns the elements of the sequence sorted using the given predicate as the comparison between elements. So the first one I'm going to do is we're just going to start simple. So it says returns the elements of the sequence sorted. This one calls for a closure and some parameters to be passed in. This one does not. So let's start small with just sorted. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to call, I'm actually going to do this. Um, we're going to give it a new instance variable. So I'm going to say let sorted numbers equal this sorted property of our numbers array. And you'll see what this is going to do here in just a second. We're going to do this a lot tonight and this will save you the grief of having to do like a for loop or redeclare certain properties because we can keep using constants and then I can just make a new constant to represent whatever the property is going to give us. So what we're going to do is we're going to say let sorted numbers equal this numbers.sorted property and then we'll just print it out so we can see you guys can get a close hand view. So we'll go ahead and run this one really quick and if you look down in the console 
what this did for us is it just numbered them starting with the lowest or least amount and up to the greatest. So it just sorted it from least to greatest for us. If I went back in here and typed in like a z another zero, we would still see it sort the same way. It's just gonna have a second zero in it this time. And it'll work if it's an integer, it'll still work for a negative value as well. So as long as I'm a whole number, I can use this sorted property to go from least to greatest. It's pretty easy. Okay, sweet. Now let's kind of amp it up a little bit. We'll uh, we'll try to make it a little bit trickier. So this number sorted property, it works for numbers. It will work for strings here in a little bit, mostly alphabetically, but it doesn't do a lot of work other than just going from least to greatest. So if I wanted to do the opposite way, let me walk you through a little bit how we would do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, let reverse numbers equal, and we'll go ahead and take that same numbers array. Now this time, if I just use this sorted property, it would do the same thing. It would just go from least to greatest. But this time I want to go say from greatest to least. So we're not gonna use the kind of pre-initialized format with just this sorted one. I'm gonna call for the closure. I'm gonna pass in the closure now, and this will let us kind of tweak the function to do what we want it to do. Okay, so I'm gonna double click this closure so it'll open up for us. And you're probably gonna see a lot of these like sorted map filter reduce in a different format than this actually. And it's just a shorthand. We're gonna do the full flush version which is tends to be three lines of code. And then I'm gonna teach you how to do the one line of code method, which is shorthand, which you've probably already seen a couple of times, honestly. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is that these parameter values are just going to represent what's in our array. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna give them a value. I'm just gonna call them X and Y. And X and Y are just going to be stand-ins for these values and the reason that I have two of them is because I have to compare. If I wanna sort them a certain way, I need to compare X versus Y. I'll need to compare zero against all the other numbers in the array. That's kind of what this parameter passing is doing. And then if we look here, this is returning a bool. So if the Boolean value matches, then it will sort it according to the bools. And you'll see that happen here in just a second. Um, does anyone know well, I'll actually just show you and then we'll we'll tweak it here in a little bit because we're gonna get more complicated. I'd rather have you see it in action and then be able to kind of adjust it as we go. So what I'm gonna do here is I do need to return a Boolean property in order for it to sort. And what I'm gonna be returning is some sort of like operation. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say X is greater than Y. So what this is gonna do is we're gonna call this sorted property, and then we're gonna say for each letter, or I'm sorry, for each number, compare it against all the other numbers in the array. So X will stand in as zero, and Y will stand in as all the other variables. And then it'll do the same thing for two. So then again, once that runs through, two will be X, and Y will be all the other variables. So it's gonna run through the code, and if X is greater than Y, that is going to be put in the array before Y. So if we compare and say X is zero and Y is two, and it says, hey, return zero is greater than two, that's gonna return false, so it's not going to sort depending on that. So let's go ahead and print it so you guys can see what this is doing. We're gonna print reverse numbers run the method, and now our numbers are reversed. Now, if I were to do this, it's gonna do the opposite, right? It's gonna work just like the sorted property, because it's gonna say, hey, X are my least numbers, and Y are my greater numbers, sort them accordingly. So in this case, we want our greater values, X, to be greater than Y. So we'll go ahead and print that again, and those should be reversed. There we go. Okay, do you guys have questions about lines 10 and 11 at all? Or does that kind of, does that kind of make sense? It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around the Boolean property sometimes. 
Now, nine times out of 10, when you guys see sorted, map, filter, reduce being used, they're not going to be used in this format. Instead, they're gonna be in a different format. In this particular instance, sorted is actually going to end up being like this. So I'm gonna say sorted by, and instead of opening up the closure, which, does someone wanna tell me what a closure is for starters? Off the top of your head. So isn't a closure, I could be wrong, but isn't a closure like almost like something that's triggered at the end of something, at the end of a, a task or function? That would, yeah. So like in a lot of cases in network calls, we've used a completion handler as a closure, like a parameter to a closure, so that certain things are being executed once the function has operated. But in short terms, and this is great for like when an employer asks, like a interviewer asks you what a closure is, you can just tell them a closure is an unnamed function. That's all a closure is. We're just passing in a different operation into something and it doesn't have a name. So weirdly enough, here, instead of passing in this whole closure, we can pass in a function. In this particular case, we can actually pass in the greater than symbol. And I'm pretty sure I could go into the documentation of this. Yes. So this greater than is a function. And what this means is it's saying left-hand side is greater than right-hand side. Whoops. Sorry, I just opened up documentation. So this is a function. This just as itself, whenever you guys use a greater than, an equal, or a less than, they're a function. They have their own Boolean property inside. Like equal should as well. Oh, probably not in this case because we're comparing against two things. But anyways, if I run this now, I'm still going to get the same result because under the hood, it's performing everything that we were doing earlier. So this whole, I'll actually type it out for you. Let's say let reversed numbers equal numbers dot sorted. And then I'll do the closure again. Remember I just did X and Y, you can have them be whatever you want, but I'm just gonna return that X is greater than Y. So this is the, this is one way of doing it lines 10 through 14, that's one way to do it, but the Swifty way to do it is line 16. Are you guys kind of getting what Swifty means now? A little bit? It's like perform really cool functions and do them in as little characters as possible. Now, if you didn't want to use sorted, you could totally use a for loop and you could say for i in numbers, if i is lower than the next number, put it first. And you could totally loop through and do that if you wanted to. But wouldn't you agree that one line is just like super, super quick? So a lot of the coding challenges that I've seen other people have been given, I haven't done more than one yet, but ones that interviewers have given people is they will say, okay, solve this coding challenge. And then once it's solved, it'll be a relatively easy problem. They'll say, okay, do, show me in another way. And usually what they're looking for is one of these four methods some variation of using these because they want to see your Swift mastery. These are like strong Swift performant codes, properties that you can use that will make you a better programmer. I don't, don't quote me on this, but I, when you guys learn Objective-C, I'm pretty sure Objective-C doesn't have access to these awesome properties like sorted. So it, interviewers and employers are going to want to see that you guys can access these Swift particular properties and are good and comfortable using them. All right, so that was us doing some sorting with numbers. We organized them greatest to least, and then we organized them least, I'm sorry. First we did least to greatest, and then here we did greatest to least. Do you guys have any questions about sorting integers? Pretty good so far? Okay, and doubles will work the same way. Doubles and floats, no problem. We can do the exact same thing here. It's just they're, they're a number type and that'll be fine. Okay. Let's get into some heavier stuff here. Let's go ahead and do, yeah, let's do names. So the first thing that I'm gonna do, just to show you a cool thing, 
is I'm going to say let sorted names equal names dot sorted. Same exact thing that we did up here. Just use the already available initializer. And then I'm going to print out our sorted, whoops, sorted names. Um, does someone want to take a guess at what kind of printout we're going to see? Alphabetically? You're exactly right. So if I run this, oh, my Xcode's struggling. <laughs> no. But if I run this, it will sort them. Why is this having such a struggle? It will sort them just like CC said alphabetically. It won't even let me build. This is so sad. I might have to reload it. That's fine. But yeah, you're exactly right, CC. It's going to sort them alphabetically, which I bet you guys can think of a lot of use cases where like it will be nice to sort things alphabetically. Did anyone else run this and see the printout? Yes. We got it alphabetically then? Okay. Yep. Oh, I'm so sad that this isn't working right now. I don't know what the deal is. Can confirm. <laughs> nice. Okay. Well, this is going to print down to here. Okay, I'm just gonna delete this because maybe that's the issue. Yeah, it is. Silly. Okay, so yeah, it ordered it ordered them from first letter, and whatever the first letter was, if it came alphabetically, put them first. So it put Ben first, then Dimitri, and it just followed in alphabetical order. Now, can someone walk me through how I would do this reverse so that we have last names first? And this isn't a trick question. Would you just run the same thing? You mean like what? With the uh, greater than? Yep. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say reversed names equal names sorted by. And then we can totally go in and do the closure if we wanted to. And if you look here, the difference being this time is that it's, it's noticed that inside of the array, these are all strings. So it's smart enough to know that these are strings here. But yeah, you're right. What we can do instead is we can just do the greater than. And as weird and roundabout as it sounds, it'll work. This will work for us. Because in the compiler's mind, it's thinking that A is greater than Z always. I'm sorry, I think A is like lesser than in this particular case, but it'll just always organize alphabetically like it's like it's an index. So like A would be the zeroth index of the alphabet, and Z would be the 25th index of the alphabet. So then it's going to reverse this for us and say, just we can look right here. So Spencer's the last on that one, and it's the first here. And then I'm the second on this, where I'm second to last here. So pretty easy, pretty like routine, pretty easy stuff to do. Do you guys have any questions about what we've done here so far? This is a cool, easy way to sort numerically and alphabetically, which I think will come in handy down the road. OK, so on each page, I've got a challenge for you guys. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you about three to five minutes on each one. Try to tackle the challenge that's here. I've provided the array for you. But I want you to try and go about this, because this is a lot of the coding challenges that you'll see similarly to the ones in your job interviews coming up. So take a couple minutes, work on it, and then I'll be back to kind of walk you through how I would solve it, which isn't necessarily the right or the best solution, but I know that my solution will work. <laughs> okay, guys, I'll give you a few minutes.
and if you guys at any point get a solution or you figured the actual challenge out, you can give me a thumbs up in the chat or a yes is great too. I think because this one is actually like one of the more intuitive of the four challenges, I'm good to just start working on it with you guys because then I think that will help you ease into the next three. So let's go talk about this one really quick. Um, so as far as the actual challenge goes, this is kind of my thought process. And I want you guys to start getting better at thinking through things a little bit, Lee. But right now it says sort the following array into two separate arrays, one for ints and one for strings. So what I'm gonna do right out of the gate is I'm gonna say, this is a let. What they've given me is a let. So I'm not gonna modify this at all. I'm not going to be appending onto it. I'm not gonna to be touching it. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna make two separate arrays. I'm gonna make a string array because one of them needs to be a string. And I'm gonna make a int array because one of them needs to be integers. And for now, I'm just gonna have them be empty because I wanna get the information out of this array and put them into the respective ones. That's what I'm gonna do right out of the, out of the gate because then I know I can go in and append into these and they will have ideally exactly what I need. Okay. So if we look at this, we're gonna see we've got four string values, even though they are actually, could be ints if we converted them. We've got four of those, and then we have four actual integer values. So we'll know that we're gonna get an output of at least four on each of those. So I just need to go to the work of making sure that I'm getting the proper things out of here. So in this particular case, I am going to use a for loop because I wanna rifle through each of the items and make sure that I'm getting the right type. And then we can go ahead and sort those because this is the next part, right, is string should be sorted alphabetically and int should be sorted from greatest to least. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna say for i, and i just stands for like imaginary number, right? For i in our random array, I'm gonna cycle through each individual element of the array here. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna set up a conditional, right? Because here I've got different types of things going on because this is of type any. What I wanna do here is check what the type is of something before I even do anything with it. And if it matches a certain type value, then I can append it to the respective array. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna say, if i is int, and that is property is just saying, hey, if this meets this criteria, if this is of type int, because you guys might've played around with this to see that like equals int won't work, double equals int won't work, is checks for a specific, I don't think we can see the documentation on it, but it checks the specific type of something. So if i is an integer, what do I wanna do with i? Append it to the int array. Exactly. I'm gonna go int array dot append i, and this will probably yell at us here in a second, which is fine. Now, this is kind of the issue with dealing of one type and then converting into an array of a different type is that it wants us to have it uh, cast it correctly. So this fix will work now. I think there are better, more optimal ways to get to this, but for now this will work. I'm fine with this for now. And then, so if it appended it correctly, great. Else if, and then here's where I wanna check if I is a string, then I want to append it to the other array. So string array dot append i. And this one's going to yell at us too because of typecasting issue. We'll just do the same thing. Just because I can see the actual data source here, I know that we're going to get those values. So I feel totally comfortable doing a forced unwrap, or like a forced downcast. But in a real app, you would wanna be more careful. You would wanna guard let against those situations or at least if let to ensure that you're getting things correct. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is we haven't touched the second part, right? But something so critical I wanna get through your guys' heads, especially now as you're like starting out, getting better at developing, start small with things. Don't try to tackle the entirety of a problem at once. Just worry about the first thing, in this case, sorting the two arrays, 
and then you can come back and worry about sorting that actual array. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to print our int array, and I'm going to print our string array. So I'm going to go ahead and print those. OK, now two problems here. Well, I guess they're both the same problems, but the issue is that strings need to be sorted alphabetically, and ints need to be sorted greatest to least. So how should I go about inside this for loop sorting those? I mean, I could probably do, do it right here, but I want to sort the actual variable integer property. I don't want to just print its sorted case specific issue. What could I modify in here to make it be more swifty here? In the conditions, you can probably add like uh, the sorted to each uh, like condition. After you append it, you can sort it. Yeah, let's do that. So I'll just do int array dot sorted. And let's do this first. I'll just do the actual regular sorted. And then we can do that here too because strings should be sorted alphabetically. So the whole string array dot sorted should do the same thing for us. So now when I print these, so if we look down here, seven, seven, six, zero, and it must consider zero to be beyond the scope of A to Z. It's past, the character value is past Z in this case. Um, so it sorted these correctly, but we still don't have our numbers sorted correctly. So knowing what you guys know about sorting numbers, what can I do to reverse that sorting method? The greater than? Yeah. We'll do sorted. And then instead of actually doing the whole closure, I'm just going to pass in the greater value. So sort by the greatest to least. That's how I like to look at it. Is just, I use the greater than symbol so that my elements are going to be sorted from greatest to least. And now I can come down here. Boom. Oh, wait. Yeah, that was right. Oh, we did want them sorted greatest to least. I think it was doing it no matter what, wasn't it? Let me check again. Oh, it was sorting for us no matter what. I thought it would sort uh, from least to greatest. Huh. Well, that worked either way, but this uh, this particular closure, we can make sure that it's always going to be greater than when it sorts. So, so we should be all good there. Now I can look back at the challenge and say, okay, I need two arrays, ones for ints and ones for strings. So I have my int, my strings, and then I've got my strings sorted alphabetically here, and I've got my ints sorted from greatest to least. Now, there are probably plenty of ways to make this faster, and that's kind of the point of us doing map and filter today. But I did just want you guys to get a dose of using sorted, because it is a cool property that you can use to organize things. You guys have any questions about sorted? I guess a better question is, do you feel like you could use sorted from now on? Give me a, a one to three in the chat, depending on how you feel about sorted, if you could use it. Okay, cool. Nice. That is good. As long as you guys are like at the two or above level, I'm happy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to commit and I'm going to say completed sorted page. Just because I want to be able to commit my progress. Okay, let's move on to map. So sorted is pretty straightforward about what it does, but map is a little interesting. Does someone want to tell me what you know about map? or what it does? I think it goes through everything in the array and it compares it against something else. Yeah. yeah, it'll do that. And filter will do that too. And reduce does that in some way. The best way to categorize map, and I think that's why they gave it a, the name map, is because it has like a lot of different things it sounds like it could do. 
one, you're exactly right. We can use it for comparison. Two, with map, we can change each individual value if it meets a criteria, or we could just change each individual value however we want it to. So what we're gonna do first for map is I'm just gonna show you guys simply how you could, hmm, can't decide if I wanna have you add one, and eh, we'll do that later. Let's transform types first. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna take all of these ints and we're going to turn them into strings. So what I'm gonna do is the same thing. I'm gonna declare a constant that can live in. And I'm gonna say let string array equal our numbers dot map. And so let's read about this really quickly. So map returns an array containing the, the results of mapping the given closure over the sequence elements. And that sounds like a lot of just like mess. <laughs> But I'll explain it here to you guys. So what it has is it's saying transform a certain element. In this case, our numbers array all is of type int. It's like we have ints in every value. So it's going to say transform every int inside of this array and turn it into, this is our generic type T, but it's just saying turn it into a different type. So what I can do here when I open up the closure is that I can declare some sort of placeholder value for each element in our array. So here I can just say like X, it's probably a good name. So X will stand for every single time this is changed in the array. And then T is going to be specifying our specific type. So what do we want to turn each int into? A string. Yep. I'm gonna declare it as a string here. So what it's gonna say is, hey, I want you to turn every value that we have here of an int into a string. So then all I have to do here is just return. It's expecting a string. So I'm just going to return, and there's two ways to do this. You could do the string initializer and just pass in A, or you could string interpolate as well. And that would be totally fine. So that would be fine. I would do, I'm sorry, not a x. Whoops, I get my variables mixed up. I'm pretty sure this will work. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll go ahead and just print out the result so that you guys can see it. So we're gonna go ahead and print our string array. And now you'll see, instead of them being integer values, we've turned everything into a string value. So I bet you guys could see this start to become handy when you think about people entering in their phone numbers or people putting in like digits where they should be putting strings. This will just be like a way that you can convert, which is really cool. Now this is the, it looks short, but this is actually the longhand version of doing this. So there's a faster, easier way to do it. And I'll just show you how to do it. So what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to clear this out actually. So nine times out of 10, like I said, you're going to see closures for things like map. They're not going to be in this format. What you're going to do is you're going to open up the closure like I just did and just delete all the contents inside the curly braces. And then what you'll do is you'll just move your code so it's all Swifty on one line, just like this. And now we can kind of make some cool different things happen. Instead of passing in all those values in our closure, we can do a couple of neat things. So what I'm gonna say here is, I just want from this to get a string. And I think we use, yeah, we just use string interpolation actually. So we're just gonna string interpolate some value. And have you guys seen this dollar sign zero used here and there? So that's a placeholder. And the dollar sign zero stands for the value that is passed in that's being mapped in the closure. So dollar sign zero is going to be zero. And then once zero is done, dollar sign zero will become one. Then it will become four, then six, then 12, then 18, then 30. So dollar sign zero just means 
each individual element of the array when it's passed into the function. Is it like an index path, kind of? Um, it's it's called inline syntax. Um, so like it's similar to an index path in that it, like an index path is a is an address for where something lives in an array, but the dollar sign zero is just the placeholder for however many items are in their array. So they work differently. But good thought. But instead of typing out the whole closure, what I can do now okay. instead, sorry, go ahead. You guys are good. So is it always gonna be dollar sign zero? Like it's no because what I noticed that like sorry, go ahead and finish Mark. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, because I noticed that like when we're doing even map, uh compact map, we use dollar sign zero too. Yes. Yeah. So generally dollar sign zero you will be the one that you use for sure because that signifies the the passed in value for the array but tonight in one of our particular functions we're going to use dollar sign zero and dollar sign one which what that means is every time that uh zero is dollar sign zero that means one in that specific function instance is going to be dollar sign one and this will be dollar sign two dollar sign three, dollar sign four, dollar sign five, dollar sign six, in that one particular time that zero is passed in the function. So nine times out of 10, you are gonna use dollar sign zero, but there are other times where you might access dollar sign one to work with it, and you'll see that later tonight. But this is just a closure being passed in, and what the closure is doing is we're just taking whatever value is in the array, and we're changing its type. In this case, we're changing it into a string. You could also do this. You could just say string dollar sign zero, and that would work the same exact way. This will work 100% the same. So that's a cool way to kind of just, I mean, we took one line of code to make that happen. Whereas like doing a for loop would take anywhere from three to five lines of code or more. So this is really swifty and cool. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and try to turn these string values into integers now. And it's going to be a lot of the same functionality. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say let number array, actually I'll call it int array, let int array equal, oops, I call it strings. So line 11 is strings. Strings dot map. And let's go ahead and do the full closure this time just so you guys can see it. Okay, so this is gonna be our placeholder value, right? This is actually what dollar sign zero is symbolizing is just this passed in parameter, each element of our array. In this particular case, I'm gonna call it str for string. And then what is this going to do for us? What is this t going to do? Turn the type, so you wanna make it an int, uh, integer? Yep. So that'll be an int. And then what I'm gonna be doing is now I know it's going to return an integer. So I need to say return int. And then what do I need to be passing in to this int initializer? STR. Yep. And this will yell at us, this is gonna be a optional typing kind of error there's two ways that i would say we can fix it in this particular instance we can force unwrap if we want or we could just neo coalesce and do a zero just say like hey if you weren't able to convert it we can turn it into a zero um it's not necessarily the best way to go about it so i feel like force unwrapping is also fine but really we're just doing this for the sake of functionality here rather than you know i'm just doing it because i want you guys to see how this works Again, be careful of <laughs> optional typing in your real code. Use guardlets and, and take care of your, your values to make sure that you have them. So what we're going to do now is we're going to print this array. And now instead of us having quotation marks around each number, it should just be the raw actual number value. Just like that. Okay. So now someone walk me through how to take this from being three lines of code and turn it into just one. Oh, you could just remove everything up until the last curly bracket. So you have just two remaining curly brackets. 
yep. and do the same thing you did in the map. So it'd be int and then dollar sign zero. Yep. Int dollar sign zero. And this will yell at us again that we need a force and wrap, I think. No, maybe it'll be fine. Yeah, so it's like it's got an optional value, which I don't love. We'll just force unwrap it. There you go. So we took what might have been like a complex situation and map just did the work of changing the type for us, which is really, really cool. So you guys used this in your networking calls when you wanted to turn JSON into your actual model or when you wanted to turn your model representation into a model file. So map is gonna be super powerful and useful when you wanna change types, specifically of things that are like hard and difficult to work with. So, okay, now let's talk about another property of map where what we could do in this particular instance is rather than changing the type of these, maybe I wanna keep them all doubles, but so in this case, we've got heights. And let's say we're hanging out with our friends and everyone's measuring each other. And I think that everyone is lying because people are wearing shoes that are making them taller than they actually are. So if I wanted to come in here and say, well, if we were at the doctor's office, they would make you take off your shoes and your real height would be this. This is where map is gonna come in super handy. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, let actual heights, this will be our actual heights, equal our height array and then we're going to go ahead and map it and instead of passing in the whole closure aspect which i totally could do i'm going to just open it up and then take out the code so that we do the shorthand way what could i do so that i modify every single aspect let's say i think everyone's shoes is there, it's throwing them off by a full inch. I think that everyone is lying about their height by a whole inch. How could I go and tweak that so that people are actually one inch shorter than what they've specified here? Would you say double and then dollar sign one? We could try it. Contextual type throws. Nope, that's not going to work for us. Can Could you, you go sorry. ahead? Could you do dollar sign zero minus point one? There we go. Uh, that's all you had to do. I mean, these look a little funky because they're doubles, but really, and, I, and we probably could turn these into ints if we wanted. We could just do this. That won't give us the decimal values, so that's fine. Because I think that they look pretty ugly when they are a double, but I mean, here, well, all we did was we said, and I could be even more specific, but all we said was, I think that you're a full inch shorter than what you actually specified. So dollar sign zero is gonna say, okay, I represent each individual element here. This is a for loop happening. That's all that's happening with this dollar sign zero. It's saying, run me through the function. And every time 5.9 comes through, make sure you minus off a full point value off of it, or sorry, a, a tenth of a point value off of it, which in this case is representing what we would say is uh, an inch. And so everyone is going to be one inch shorter than what they've specified here. So 5.9 is going to become 5.8. Same thing with 5.11. It's going to be 5. Point... Wait, hold on. That's going a lot down, isn't it? Should it be 01? No, you're right. We're right, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just got confused for a second. But all we're doing is we're saying every time the placeholder comes up minus the value by 0.1. And I could do it even more drastic if I wanted to. I'd say you're a full foot, you're lying about your height by a full foot. 
and then everyone's height is going to decrease by one foot. So map is a really cool property where you can just go and adjust something in an array pretty easily. It doesn't take a lot of work to go in and adjust each thing. Whereas a for loop would take a little bit more effort and a few more lines of code. Okay, now let's kind of change some strings down here. Before I move into this, do you guys have any questions about what we did here? Mitch. Yes. The reason I think why it's doing that is because it is a decimal and not done in inches. So where you have 5.10, that's the same thing as 5.1. Oh, uh, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Which is like either we'd have to do two things. We'd have to do full rounded feet, which is not accurate if someone someone's either going to be five feet tall or six feet tall, or we'd have to do everything in inches. So for the sake of this this example, just go with it. But you guys get that right. You got, you see how the, the map was working there? Okay, good points, you see. Okay, cool. Now what we're going to do for these names is I don't love that everyone's name is lowercase because I'm a grammar nerd, and I think that every single proper name should be capitalized. So what I'm going to walk you guys through now is how to go through a name, a string, and make sure you get it to be capital so that the first letter is capitalized. So does anyone want to take a stab at walking me through how to do this? Oh, well, you could just say let name array equal names dot map and then in the map would you just dot capitalize or capitalize whatever so if you got rid of all that yeah let's try it we do dollar sign zero to represent each element in the array which it should be smart enough to know that these are strings and then what did you say to do austin uh, dot cap Capitalize. So I don't have the capitalized property. And I will give super brownie points to anyone who can tell me why capitalized isn't working. And if you guys have capitalized working on your end, I will be shook. Isn't capitalized a text quality? It's like a string quality, right? It is a string yes. quality. Yeah. But this has to deal with more of the actual playground than anything. And this I put this in on purpose to kind of trick you guys, but it's Would mostly you like, you. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Would you have to force that to be a string? No, it's oh. already a string. This is already going to know that it, there's no documentation for it. But I mean, our array is of type string. So it knows that the placeholder value is going to be a string every time. And you guys have worked with strings before, like we've used that capitalized property. The main reason that this doesn't work is that our playground isn't smart enough yet. Our playground isn't intuitive enough to know about it. So, import. Or are we going to say bark? Import. You're muted. Import foundation. It's going to take a minute. There we go. So this is going to hammer down the importance of frameworks for you guys. Because I think you've done some core data before. And then you'll go into core data and you're like, why can I not use NS fetch results controller? Or why can't I use the, ma the manage object context? And it's probably because you haven't imported a necessary framework. Foundation is just like UI kit. It's got like everything that you might and will need, but the playground itself is not smart enough to know everything about every type unless we import foundation. And I could even go a step further um, if you were working in a, like an iOS playground, you could import UIKit. This in particular is a Mac OS playground. So Cocoa is the main framework. It's like UIKit for Mac OS. So you have to just be like 
you have to give your playground or your project all the smarts that it needs so that it can access those things. And then I can come in now, capitalize name, whoops. And I'll run this and we should be good. There we go. So it capitalized all the first names. Now a pitfall that I could see a lot of you guys running into initially would be like to use uppercase. And uppercase capitalizes every single character, not just your initial character, like the very first one. So that's just like, like yelling at you almost. So uppercase and lowercase come for free with Swift, but this whole capitalized aspect is something that you'll need to import UIKit or Coco or Foundation for just to get access to. So that's a fun little trick that I wanted to show you. But map is really cool because you didn't have to do a for loop to capitalize people's names. You just had to funnel them through this closure, this map closure. One last thing before I let you guys go for the challenge. Does anyone know the difference between map and compact map? So I need to let it populate here. But names equal, oh shoot, but name equal names dot map. <clears throat> okay, so map returns an array containing the results of mapping the given closure over the sequence element. In other words, changing each element. Compact map returns an array using the non nil results. So the cool thing about compact map is that it won't fail if you have nil values. So if you have like optional that, so if you said specifically in your journal project that you guys were working on today, if the body of a journal text was optional and a user decided to not put it in and you didn't care that they didn't have body text because it's optional, that's where a compact map would come in handy because you don't need to know about each specific value. Things can be nil and whatever is not nil will just get passed through and used. And if it is nil, it won't crash on you. So compact map just removes nil values. So that's kind of the main difference for that flat map. I'm not super well versed in flat map, but we can kind of learn about it together here. I don't know that I've ever used it. Let's see if it'll pull up. So returns an array containing the concatenated results of calling the given transformation. Oh, I think it'll just combine them together, which we're gonna touch on in reduce anyways. So we won't worry about that one too much, but I did want you guys to see the difference between map and compact map in that compact map doesn't care about nil values. It will still run properly and it will just sort out the nil, the nil values. All right, before I let you guys get into this challenge, do you have any questions about transforming to different types or transforming elements in an array? Pretty good so far? Okay, cool. All right, so what we're gonna do here is I've got you a list of student scores and I want you to take these values because they're strings and turn them into doubles. And then once they're doubles, we can perform some math on them. So what ha what's happening here is that everybody in the class got extra credit. So we're going to add a half grade point to each value. Now you couldn't really add that to a string correctly, but use map to change them into doubles. And then once they're doubles, you can add 0.5 to each of them. And then we're going to use sorted again to order them. So I'm going to leave you guys three or four minutes to try and work through that and see if you can get those sorted. Sorry, mapped and sorted. And I'm gonna turn my light on because I look like a zombie in here. And thumbs up in the chat if you figure it out.
Sorry, I probably should have put on some sort of timer. Um, I will be just... a... Sorry, what? Oh, sorry. Did you, like a thumbs up? Did you say thumbs yeah, up in the participant do, thing? Yeah, you can do a thumbs up in the participants list, or you can give me a yes, either one. Sorry, I meant to set a timer, but oh well. Okay, I will give the rest of you guys just like 30 more seconds. Don't feel bad if you didn't get it, because this is kind of like, this is tough to do, and... It's tough to do it in crunch time. If you're in a real coding challenge environment, you're going to get more than a minute to do something like this, hopefully. Although I did take a, it's called Triple Byte. It's like a company that does like streamlined testing for you so that you can opt out of the first couple rounds of an interview. Um, and I did do their coding challenges and there was 35 questions and they give you like a minute for each one. Um, so that was kind of a scramble, but it went well. Isn't that like an extra stamp of approval if you get past that stamp bite thing or whatever it is? Yeah, I think what, so tomorrow I have a practice interview with them, but I think what it is is there's a final interview if you pass the initial test. So like I'll show you guys, and I'm actually like embarrassed of the results. Let me show you guys the results that I got They're right here. So these were my results and the saddest part is that my worst scores were in iOS stuff. <laughs> they were in mobile stuff, which is like all I've been studying. I don't know what, but there were like a couple of tricky Objective-C questions and things. But anyways, so what you do is you take the test. And then if you pass the test, they'll let you do a final interview. I'm doing a practice interview tomorrow. And then your final interview is kind of like a real simulated interview environment. And then what they'll do is that they've got comp like third parties, like companies that are outsourcing interviewing through them. And so if you make it past triple bytes final interview, then companies are gonna be like, oh, we'll just come and do the last interview with us and then we'll bring you on. Cause it kind of just skips the whole big first couple steps of an interview process, which is cool. But anyways, yeah, I had to do some like crunch time coding stuff like this for my triple byte questions. Good practice. All right. Um, does anyone want to walk me through their solution or what they did? Uh, I just had let double strings equal scores dot map. And then I just did double, wrote double, and then in parentheses did the dollar sign zero, and then did an exclamation point, and then did plus 0 0.5. I'm not sure. Oh, why uh, am I? Yeah, that was taking a while. Sorry, I was totally listening, but I just also was dealing with all that. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I wasn't, I can't see your screen when I was talking, so I wasn't sure. Oh, you're good. You're good. So, what you did is you did a double of every placeholder. Yeah, and then a plus 0 0.5. Nice. After I did the little exclamation point, I'm not sure if it's needed. Yeah, it'll, uh, it'll force you to force it. Well, it'll, it needs to be forced to unwrap. And then I print that. And I make another constant beneath that called let array numbers equal double strings dot sorted by greater than I don't know what you call that but the equal. and then the uh, and then I printed that the array number my x code is struggling but you're exactly right um there we go sorted by and then this one is greater than right so the greatest values come first and then you can go ahead and print your Array numbers. Yep. So just like that. And then I can run this. And now we can see here everything got incremented. So it got turned into a double in this first line 34. Everything got turned into a double and added 0.5 for the extra credit. And then it went ahead to sort them down here, which was really cool. Um, if I were to, if an employer said, do this in one line of code and the print statement would be kind of a roundabout way to do this. But this is what I would do if I wanted to shorten it even more. And this is like sort of cheating. And I'm just going to say this, I'm going to say uh, double grades, double scores, I would say just to be descriptive of what it is. And then what I would do is I would just go print double scores dot sorted Come on, it needs to populate. Oh, it needs to be a bar. Bar double scores dot 
sorted. And then if my sorted by, yeah, there we go. Then technically I'm writing one line of code and doing one print statement. Little bit of cheating. I'm sure there's another better way to factor it into this map, but for the most part, it does exactly what I need it to do, which is really cool. Nice. So that was a fun, just like tricky combination of everything that we did here and the sorted function mixed into it as well. Can you guys give me a one to three on how you feel about map so far? I would say map is a little bit trickier than sorted. Looking great. Nice. Nice job, guys. Okay, and then now I'm going to say completed map page. Send that commit up. Okay. So you said, oh, so you said oh, that right, compact, so. compact map is for optionals or it's for things that have nil that could return a nil? Yeah, compact map will ignore nil values. So whereas map might de be dependent on everything having a value and potentially crashing if it doesn't, compact map isn't going to care. Compact map is going to not worry about no values and only worry about things that have values. Yeah. So you guys will see some use cases for it, but for the most part, I think you'll use compact map quite a bit in like networking functions or when you're converting JSON decoding, like decoded JSON into your model object, you'll do that with compact map. All right, cool. Um, do you guys want to take a brief break before we jump into filter? Or are we feeling okay? Should we take a little break? Okay, let's take a five minute break. The last two are actually pretty quick. So we'll get through those fairly quickly. Um, go ahead and take a break guys and I'll see you back here at about 20 after.
All right, guys. Austin, how's uh, round two going for you? Uh, great. I'm actually learning a lot more than I did the first time, especially about like the panic of what's going to be, what's core data going to be like and all that. I mean, my <laughs> first time I absolutely hated UI. So this time I kind of fall in love with it, I guess you could say. That's uh, also the beauty. I would encourage all of you guys to go for a TL ship. Try to be a TL. Um, there are going to be plenty of opportunities for you to do it, whether you do it like I did, right as soon as you finish the core, or you go do labs and then do it after labs, or you TL part time. There's tons of possibilities. So I just feel like going back over things at least once more than just the core was so helpful for me. So like getting to learn it alongside you guys for the second time in a lot of ways has just like made all the difference. Because there are a lot of things that I would never be able to teach you guys had I not been exposed to them at least twice. So I highly recommend TLing and flexing is awesome. I think flexing is an awesome, awesome tool that we're lucky to have. So but yeah, if you guys have questions about being a TL, let me know because there is like an application process and Technically, you could do it as early as all of you guys are in the program right now. You could start being a TL, technically. So, all right, um, let's jump into filter. So, someone wants to take a wild guess and ask what, or tell me what filter does. CC smiling like, I think I know what it does. <laughs> it does a comparison and only gives you those results that are like true to that comparison yes it's we're going to pass in a boolean property as a closure and then it will evaluate that and if it's true it will return those values if it's not true it will ignore those values so what we can do here is with and a set of numbers, I could give it a, a specifying point of saying like, well, let's just do it actually. Let's just say I have passing scores and I want anything that's above 80 to be a passing score. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to access the array and then I'm going to use the filter property just like this. Let's go ahead and do the longhand version just so you guys can see the actual under the hood stuff. So what this is doing again is this is gonna be our placeholder. This is gonna be our dollar sign zero. I'm just gonna give it X or I could even just call it score if I wanted to. And it needs to return a Boolean value. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna return some sort of statement. And if the statement is true, each score will be appended think of it as almost like a new array that we're making. Um, it'll be appended to this passing scores. And if it doesn't meet that Boolean property, it'll be ignored. So what I can do is I can say score is greater than 80. Maybe 80 is our passing grade. And then I can come in here and print passing scores. And I should see everything above 80 print out. And I do. So these are already sorted. We could totally go back and sort it if we wanted to, but you guys already did that in the last question, the last challenge that we just did. But um, what would I do if I wanted to include 80? Because there is a student with a score that got an 80. How could I include them in this? Greater than or equal to? Yep. Greater than or equal to zero. And now that will add that extra person there. So these are all of our passing scores. And some poor soul only did the extra credit and two other people never showed up for class either. So that's a cool way to do that. But this is the longhand version, right? So we can totally do the shorthand version just like this. I'm just going to work inside the curly brace, the closure. And does anyone want to take a guess at how I could configure this? Could you use the dollar sign zero again? Yep, dollar sign zero. So that'll take place of every single value in the array. 
And then what do I need to be doing? The greater, greater than, than 80. To, greater than or equal to 80. And let's go ahead and run it. So we get the same output, but we wrote two fewer lines of code. It's very swifty, looks really good. To an onlooker, they might not know exactly what's going on unless you understood this syntax that dollar sign zero is taking place of each value in the array and that this is actually a Boolean evaluator. This is checking to see if something meets this criteria. So it's going to say 100.5 is greater than or equal to 80. True. Add it to the array. 73.0 is greater than or equal to zero. False. Don't worry about it. Don't add it into the array. So hopefully that makes sense. That's a pretty easy way to use filter. It's pretty straightforward and easy. Uh, but, Mitch, you said this would be kind of confusing for someone just looking at. Does, does that mean we should always make sure to write like details about these kind of functions in our well, code? I, so I just need it if like a like you guys as brand new developers, if you guys saw this for the first time, you'd just be kind of like, what the hell's happening here? But like your future employers and people that are going to code challenge you and things like that, they're going to love to see this because this means that you're understanding more than just the face value of a property. You are looking at this and you already know this closure is a Boolean evaluator. This is checking true or false. This isn't making any computation. This isn't changing any value inside of here. This is just checking a bool. And you know that by writing it out. And so the, the employer or whoever your interviewer is going to look at this and be like, this is Swifty code. Like you did this really well. They're going to be impressed with your skills. Whereas like a beginner developer is not going to know all of what's going on here. So this looks really sharp. This looks really good. Okay. Let's, uh, let's do a little bit of a trickier one here. So, and this will kind of speak to the importance of having like enums or like regularized code, because if you had a text field and you wanted a user to write something inside of it, like a yes or no, you could get any combination of these. Whereas using like a segmented control or an enum or something would be a lot better. But there are there might be use cases where you messed up and you let the user input strings and you're gonna have to find a way to kind of convert those values or get them to be a certain way. And not just yes or no, someone might put like addresses in wrong or someone might put like a phone number in incorrectly. And so filter is going to do the work of making sure that you get this correct. So in this particular case, I want to filter through all of the yeses and all of the noes, and I want to count how many there are of each. We could totally do it from an eyeball standpoint, but if we had hundreds of thousands of lines of code in this array, that would be super tedious. So this is kind of a silly example for it, but it's, it's pretty easy. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make two. I'm going to make two arrays. So I'm going to say our yes count array, and I'm going to say our no count array. And we'll leave this blank for a second, but I just wanted to point out that that's what we're going to be doing. So we got our yes count. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go into our responses and I'm going to filter out everything that meets my criteria. So we'll open up this closure. And from now on, I'm just going to keep using shorthand syntax. We'll use this inline syntax. And what do I want to be? Hmm, this is going to be like, kind of tricky to think about, but this is going to be a bool, right? So if I wanted to add it to this yes count array, what kind of Boolean evaluator could I put in here in the closure to be checking that? Could you count the um, characters in the string? We could, but I mean, knowing what we know about our data, mm -hmm. we don't need to count particularly the data in the string. I just want to know how many yeses there are. This is like a tricky thing to kind of intuitively think through. Are you saying like yes would be true and no would be false? Exactly. OK. So knowing what you know about that, CC, how do you think you would go about setting this up?
we're going to use our placeholder, right? We've got dollar sign zero. That's going to count for every element, <clears throat> excuse me, every element in the array. And a Boolean. Double equal signs? Yeah, exactly. A Boolean is going to check that something is equal to something else. Mark, what would I put it, what would I set it equal to here? True. Well, that's going to be the, what that's going to be the value because like if it ends up if dollar sign zero is equal to whatever is here that will return true would you just do like quotation oh, mark so yes yes okay let's try that so let's go ahead and print our yes count and what i'll do is i'll just do dot count and you guys will see why here in a second so this is telling me that I have three and I can come back in the array and look and I see one, two, three, four, five yeses. So this isn't optimized for everything we need it to do. Not everything is quite there yet, but you guys are super close. All that I would do, what we can do is this is going to be a placeholder for every single value that's passed in. So it's a string value, and every string has a lowercase property to make sure that all the values are placed lowercase. So first thing, if I went in and printed yes count now, all the yeses should look the exact same. Oh, that's a bool property, sorry. So it's not actually going to modify them yet. But if I do dot count, it will count five. So we're not actually changing the value, but it's just saying, hey, every time an, an element is passed through the array, make it lowercase. And if, it, if in its state of being lowercase, if it equals this exact phrase, this exact string, return true. And if it doesn't, don't worry about it. So how would I go about doing the no count. Basically the same thing, just with no. Yep. Responses dot filter. Dollar sign zero. Our placeholder lowercase. So every time, make sure our our placeholder is lowercase, and then set it equal to no. And then I can do this. I can just print yes count, no count. And I sh looking at our things here, I should have one, two, three, four, five yeses, and one, two, three, four noes. So we're going to know we did this exactly right if we see five and four. Oh, sorry. I should have printed the count. Whoops. So you'll see here. Filter isn't changing our elements. It's just checking them. We would use map if we wanted to change all of these to be a specific way. So if I run this now, we've got five yeses and four noes. So that was pretty swifty what we did. We took an array. We, well, we made a new array for both of these, but for one, we took an array that existed. We filtered out everything inside of it, we changed each of those filtered elements to be lowercase and then set them equal to this yes value. So this would return true for all of these yeses if they were spelled the right way. And then this would return true if all these no's were at least spelled N-O in any sort of capitalization, it would have worked. But if you look here, if I type no and run this, we're still gonna get five and four because it's not optimized enough to recognize those spelling values. So this isn't a perfect solution, but we're pretty close. It's pretty swifty. So that's another thing too, is just like, always look for where your code could fall through or what could fail. And that will help you be a, a better programmer to come back to these things and kind of refine these methods. Do you guys have any questions about filter? Okay. Um, all right. Let's do, I don't want to keep you guys too late tonight.
So let's go through this challenge together and I'll talk you through how I would do it. And then we can jump through reduce because I think reduce is maybe the most important out of all four of these. Um, and that way we can get you guys out of here before the hour's up. Okay, so the challenge here is we're using filter to divvy up the following array into two arrays. So one would end up being Hayden's group and one would end up being Jonah's group, but we wanna split them alphabetically. So out of you guys, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 students. So both Mark and, or I'm sorry, not Mark. I was just looking at Mark's little Brady Bunch view and I said Mark, I don't know why, but both Jonah and Hayden would each have five students. Now it's not gonna be organized to the way that you guys have your TL groups organized right now, but this is just a practice problem. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, once again, declare two arrays. Um, we'll do Jonah's first, but just imagine that we, I just don't want it to run a compiler error. But I want Jonah's group to go first. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do students.filter, and then we'll go ahead and pass in the closure. like this. But how can we do this? How do you guys think that we can do this? So that only half of the first alphabetical students, the first five students in the alphabet, get added to Jonah's group. Would you sort the students and then use the greater than? Students dot sorted. Greater than, we can give it a try. I didn't think about this initially. Right. Jonah's group. So this is the issue with the closure is that the closure is calling for a Boolean property. So we can't, this specific closure for filter is asking for a bool. So that's a little bit tricky to configure it that way because we're sorted by calls its own closure. So there's a closure within a closure within a closure. So it gets a little dicey. Can anyone else think of it maybe a different way that we could go about it? Because we're evaluating a bool here. And this is gonna be kind of a trick question because this is another property that, and I, lo I, I love this lesson that I'm teaching you guys tonight because it's a lot of properties that you might've come across but you didn't know how to use yet. I've got another one for you. So I'm gonna use dollar sign zero to represent each item of student. And then there's this cool value that's called lexicographic sorting. Does anyone know what lexicographic is or like what the method is to do something lexicographically? It's sort of a fancy way to say organize. There's a lot of way, there's a lot of things that lexicographic can do. In particular, if you wanted to dumb it down for like an elementary school kid and they saw that word, you'd just say, it's just a fancy way to organize something. So if you look, this is a Boolean property. And it actually has a parameter that we can pass in. So dollar sign zero lexicographically precedes. And another way I would say this is it comes before what? What could we pass in here to make it come before? You kind of have to think about this intuitively with the data that you've been given. Brian? Did you say Brian? We could pass in Brian. Let's pass in Brian and see what comes up. So we'll pass in Brian, and then I'm gonna print Jonah's group. So right now, Jonah did get some students. He got Alex Schillingford and he got Alex Rhodes, but that doesn't really solve our solution because for one, we didn't make two arrays yet. And two, he's supposed to have five students, whereas right now he only has two. So we're on the right track though. Let's go ahead and do Hayden's group as well. Students dot filter. And then I'll close out this guy so that we have some space. How could I do this so that it's 
uh, the opposite, the reverse of whatever is being computed in Jonah's. Jonah's grave dot reverse. We could do dot reverse, but dot reverse, what it would do is just takes the order and does the backwards of it. So like, so dot reversed. Where's the collections in a string? I don't even know what this is going to give us. We can give it a try though. I'm guessing it's not going to compile because it's not auto-completing, but let's try. Yeah, so here's another issue is that this needs to be a Boolean. But there's this really awesome, cool thing that you guys have seen probably quite a bit. I'm going to do the same thing that I did. Lexicographically graphically proceeds. We can do Brian again if we want. But there's a cool property that means the opposite of or is not thing operator. So I, I love this too, because all your faces, you're like, I know that. Like, I already knew that. And it's just funny. You have to just think of these things conceptually and then just have use cases to apply them and you'll get really good at it. So now we should have our two arrays. But here's the issue is that Alex and both Alex's got added to Jonah's group, but everybody else got added to Hayden's. So still, how, how can I tweak this? Uh, I still don't understand why the two Alex's are in Jonah's group. Like what's causing that? Okay, so this is our dollar sign zero, so that's the placeholder value. And then lexicographically proceeds is a cool property. It says returns a Boolean value, indicating whether the sequence precedes another sequence in a dictionary ordering. So I like to think of this as Brian is something we're looking up in a dictionary. So if dollar sign zero, if other words, if everything in here comes before Brian, go ahead and add it to Jonah's group. But if it doesn't, ignore it. And then we're doing the exact opposite here in saying that, hey, if anything comes after Brian, or it maybe even includes Brian, add it to the array. Does that make sense? Hopefully, maybe. Okay. Sorry. Oh, yeah, but it's sorting it. Oh, sorry. I think you guys both spoke at the same time. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, but it's sorting it actually alphabetically because a, uh, those are the two names that are like that precede B, I guess. So exactly. It's well, not, we can even not do really doing what we want, though. We don't even have to pass in a full name. We can give it a specific value here, and it will do that for us. Still works the same way, but what if we try C? Now we come in for this line of code. Everything before the letter C is going to be populated in that array. And everything it comes after that is populated. So here's the tricky part is that you just kind of have to tweak this until you get to a comfortable spot. So just so, mess with these letters until it gives you what you want is what you're saying? In this specific data set, yes. Oh, all right. Because it seems a bit tricky if you do that kind of like a live app. Oh yeah, you'd have to you'd have to have some like some data science going on. You'd have to have some evaluative measures. This is just particular to our class. And well, couldn't you do something like students dot count? Yeah, exactly. Equals if it's like divided in half, and then half goes to Jonah, half go to Hayden. Yeah, the tricky part is like you'd have to sort them first. So you could do that, but I. I think that was the point of like filter as I wanted you guys to, to use filter to divvy it, up, divvy it up so you get some practice. But like you said, there are so many optimal solutions to get to a point. This is just one of many. In this particular case too, I wanted you guys to use this property because this is useful. So if I keep monkeying with this, let's see. So let's say we want to add CC. So I'm going to do D now. So we're getting close. There's four here, but there's five here. 
And I can see that the next names in the alphabet all are with J. So let's go jump into J and see if we can tweak with that. This probably isn't going to do a whole lot. So now we kind of have to get sort of case specific. So what I would do is I would just find the name that sits directly in the middle of the three. It's so like Jake, Jordan, Josh. The one that's in the very middle is Jordan. So I would just pass his name in, him being like the middle threshold, the middle point. And there we go. I've got five students there and five students there. Pretty like swifty, sneaky way to do it. But, and like you guys said, you were thinking about other optimal solutions. So those are going to be great. Like you would love to walk into a coding challenge and think of five ways to do something rather than worry about one. Right. So good work. Okay. But this one actually like wasn't super hard. It's just like knowing what filter does and kind of what to pass into its closures can be difficult to think about, but you guys did a really good job with that. So do you guys have any questions about filter? Okay, how about a one to three in the chat about how you feel about it? Rad, okay. So we completed our filter page and then we'll move on to the last one. Reduce is actually my favorite because it's just, it's pretty straightforward, it's pretty easy. And reduce the name itself is sort of misleading. Um, but if you think about it this way, it'll help you. <clears throat> so reduce isn't so much as like subtracting from. Reduce is taking a set of data and turning it down to one specific value. So we can take an array and turn it into just one singular instance of an object. So if I had an array of doubles, like we're gonna do here, I can condense it down to just be one particular value so this is great for like averages mins max i mean there already is a min and a max property that you can use in arrays which is cool but if you wanted to calculate averages or if you wanted to calculate certain values or do like a summative measures like this is a great way to do it this is what reduces for reduces to take a set of data and crunch it down to reduce it into one usable item so let's say that we wanted to get the average height Let's say this is our uh, group of friends that lied about how tall they are because they actually have shoes that are an inch higher than what they actually are. But if I wanted to check for the average height, I can use reduce to do that. So I'm going to say heights dot reduce. And let's go ahead and look at reduce. So it says returns the result of combining the elements of the sequence using the given closure. So this is. Um, well, reduce is definitely the most intricate of the four that we're talking about tonight. It requires a little bit more think through. So don't let this initial result confuse you. This is your starting point. This is the value at which you want things to start. If you're dealing with numbers, it might vary, but generally you're going to start at zero. If I started at a different value, it might skew the data. So this zero value doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to start with zero and times by 5.9 or add 5.9. It's just that we're not going to make any sort of constant to adjust from. We're going to start at a basic constant of zero. And then I'm going to open up this closure. And what this is going to do is it's going to ask us for a result and a double and a return type and then the way that we're going to return it. So I'm actually just gonna call this result. And then this double, I will say is our height. Now, thinking through this intuitively, what if you were trying to sum all these up and get an average, what sort of type would we want that one value to be at the end of this? Double? Yes. So this is our return type. We're gonna make sure that we return a double. That's kind of the first thing that we'll do, we'll do here is we're going to return something that's going to be a double. And what I would do is I'm just going to say 
our result is zero, but that result is going to change as it cycles through the array. So at first it's gonna be zero, and we're going to add the height to it. So it's going to be zero plus 5.9. And then the second iteration of this result is going to be 5.9 and height is going to be 511. On the third iteration, result is going to be 5.9 plus 511 plus the next result in the iteration. Does that make sense to you guys? Zero is our starting point, but it's eventually going to compound as it goes through each item in the array. And I'll show you the shorthand, and I feel like actually the shorthand is easier. <clears throat> so let's do this. Let's go ahead and print our average height. And I'll see if you guys can tell me what's <clears throat> wrong with this. What's wrong with our average height? 38.81. You didn't divide by the number of elements in the array. Exactly. We're, we're getting a sum here. We're not actually getting the average height. Because remember, height, um, the sum is going to be all of our added values together. But we're actually calculating the average, which is should be the sum divided by the number of values that we have. So what I can do here is just divide our average height. I can divide that by our heights dot count. Now this is going to yell at us because average height is going to become a double, but heights dot count is an int. So this is another typing issue. Does anyone know how I could fix this particular issue? Just say int and then put down the parentheses. Yeah, well this is already an int, so we want it to be a double instead, but you're exactly right. We'll do double and then convert the integer into a double. And now when I run this, I should get like 5.5 .5 or something. Yes, so this is our average height. Out of the set of data that we've been given, we summed it up and then divided it by the number of items that are in our array. And we got 5.5 .5 as the average height. So this is the like longhand way to do it. Um, let's do, I'm trying to decide if I want to do the shorthand way with you or not quite yet. Yeah, we might as well. Let's do the shorthand, it'll be fun. So I'm gonna keep that double divided by double dot count because we're still gonna to wanna to calculate that value. But what we're gonna do here instead of incorporating that result, Mark, this is where, I don't know if Mark's still here, I think he is, yeah. Mark, this is where the dollar sign zero plus the dollar sign one is gonna come in handy. So what this is gonna do is that dollar sign zero is going to be the first iteration, while dollar sign one is going to be the second iteration. And then it will take the sum of these two and add them to our initial value. And then on the second iteration, 5.1 is going to be the first placeholder. And 5.1, sorry, that's 511. 5.10 is going to be the second iteration. So I'm doing the exact same thing here. It's just shorthand. 5.55. Same value. Same everything. So you guys can probably see why this is way more used, this whole closure syntax. It's so much faster. It's two fewer lines of code. It's fewer characters. It looks really, really clean. It's just the tricky part is knowing what to do with it. If I wanted to do a product, for whatever reason, I could totally times all the values. I could times this by this, and then times this by this, and times this by this. There's a lot of operations that you can perform in here, which are really cool. In this particular case, we're just calculating the average height. So all we need to do is take, add up all these values and then divide them by their count, which is all we did here. Do you guys have any questions about this first one that we did? Feel okay with it so far? Okay, all right, we're almost done. 
Um, this next one is going to be symbolic of your GitHub contributions. So if I wanted to just find out your total contributions, this is two weeks worth, this is 14 days worth. If I wanted to find out your total number of contributions over a two week period, knowing what you guys know about reduce, how would I do this? Who's feeling brave? This is actually easier than the one we did on line lines four through eight. So would you say like dollar sign zero and then leave out that dollar sign one and then outside instead of doing divided by, you would do add? Yeah, I mean, actually, we're going to do the same exact thing. The exception being that we're not going to factor in any sort of divide, like what's the word for it? anything to divide it with. So if you keep the uh, dollar sign one, that's all you're gonna put, right? Is dollar sign zero plus or whatever we're doing, dollar sign one. That's it, that's all we're gonna do. Cause so we, gonna we have a, sorry, say that again. We're just gonna like ping back off each other throughout the whole thing. Yeah, so when I come in and open up this closure here, all I'm doing is I'm saying first placeholder plus the second placeholder in each iteration. So like I said before, dollar sign zero on the first iteration of reduce, dollar sign zero is two, dollar sign one is 12. So it's going and to add those. Like, that you put heights there? I'm confused on the heights thing. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I should have done the other one. Oh. You're good. Good catch. We should be using the right array. But yeah, so in this particular closure, we're just saying, okay, cycle through every aspect of the array and each iteration go through starting with the first index two is dollar sign zero 12 is dollar sign one add them together and you get 14 and this is our initial result we started at zero but it's going to take that 14 and add it on top so then if we go in and print our github contributions oh sorry our total contributions Now we have 78. You would be like, wow, I had 78 commits for two weeks. That's pretty good. That actually is pretty good. Except on the weekends that you were a slacker and didn't code at all. Not that you guys do that, right? No one's taking the weekends off. Just kidding. I hope you're taking the weekends off. Those are important. You should rest and get away from your computer and breathe fresh air, but yes. We can talk about your GitHub contributions on Friday when we have our little career chat. Don't be scared, you guys, it'll be fine. All right, so this was cool. We, we took an array, a set of data, and then converted it into just one particular instance in one line of code. It was really easy. I mean, the print statements we don't even need because like, I could totally just run the code and it would print off the side. I really don't need the print statements to prove anything. They're just there so you guys can see them in the console, but like, the point being is that these functions are so cool in getting your code to be swifty. Okay, let's do strings. So let's do this. I want you to, in this particular instance, instead of adding up all these numbers, I want to turn them all into strings and then make one big long string of all these numbers. So rather than adding them up, this is what we're going to do. We're going to say, let's, let's do contribution string equal and this will be another really cool feature of reduce we're going to reduce and what we're going to do is we are going to actually start not with a zero but an empty string and what we're going to do is we're going to keep adding to this empty string so that it fills up with all these numbers. So what I can do here is I can say dollar sign zero plus dollar sign one. And now this is going to throw errors to us. 
and it's saying binary operator cannot be applied to operands of type underscore and type int. So our, and this is a tricky concept, dollar sign zero is always going to be intuitive depending on what you pass in the closure. In this particular case, we gave it a base value of a string, an empty string. So it's gonna be smart enough to know that dollar sign zero is going to become a string. But it's not smart enough to know that every other iteration of the array is of type int and needs to change. So what could I do to change dollar sign one to become a string? Just force that to be a string? Yeah, I'm just gonna, I like to string interpolate. I feel like it looks better to me. but we could totally use the string initializer as well. And now what I can do is I can print my contribution string. Whoa, that's not the right one. Contribution string, print that out. There you go. Way more impressive than saying you had 78 commits when you had like 212 trillion commits. Pretty rad. So, this isn't like the most useful case, but in circumstances like converting phone numbers or uh, I don't know, there are a lot of circumstances where I feel like this will come in handy for you. Um, the real reason that we didn't have to string interpolate this one, I think it'll still work regardless. And you might wanna do it just for clarity's sake. But your dollar sign zero, your inline syntax is really smart depending on the closure. So I wish dollar sign one was smart enough for it, but it's apparently not. But dollar sign zero is smart enough to adapt to what are you, whatever you pass in the closure. So if I passed in an initial value of zero here, it would be smart enough to know that dollar sign zero, it's looking for a int. It can make whatever is there into an int, hopefully. So that's kind of why that's the way that it is, but I wish dollar sign one was intuitive enough. It's not, and that's fine. That's why string interpolation is really cool. All right, let's jump through this last little bit. So I've given you guys some personal information. Please don't go tell everyone this. But um, what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna organize all of these strings into a line so that I have this maybe like, I could put it on a job application or I could put it on like a, I don't know, something. So let's do, uh, I'll call it my info. So we'll say my info, you guys can call it Mitch's info or whatever you wanna call it. But we can take the contact information array and what we can do is we can reduce it. Same thing, I'm gonna start with an empty array. And what I'm gonna do now, same thing, I'm just gonna do dollar sign zero plus dollar sign one. And we'll go ahead and print my info. Now there's gonna be a problem with this, not necessarily that it's not gonna compile, but there's a little bit of ugliness, right? Like there's no gap in between. So how would I add a space? Just an empty okay. string. Yeah, we'll just, in the middle of these, I'll just add an empty string. And now they should space out. Should space out pretty good. What if I wanted to add these onto different lines? Does anyone know what I would do? A backslash and an N, is it, for new line? Yeah. Do you have an idea of where I would put that? Right before whatever you're trying to put on the new line? Yeah, so in this particular closure, where do you think I would put it? Um, right in the middle where those strings are. Let's try it. Backslash n means new line. So let's run this and see what it does. You wouldn't need a plus, do you? There we go. Um, I believe that you still need the plus because I meant before the uh, dollar sign one. I guess if it works either way. 
Yeah, it needs to have some sort of operand in between to kind of concatenate the strings together. So now it looks a lot sharper because we've divvied them up to go on different lines. Okay, cool. So that's what backslash n does. It's, it makes a new line. And this works for UI. This works for buttons. This works for, this works for a lot of awesome things. So you're going to be able to use backslash n for a bunch of different use cases. All right, last challenge. If you guys need to go, that's totally fine. I will be posting the completed four pages and the video as well if you want to look back on it. But if you have to go now, no big deal. But this last challenge will be pretty quick. Um, I will give you guys a couple of minutes to fight through it here. Um, I've made it a var for a reason. And maybe you guys will kind of think about why when you start to configure this and see what the printout. But I want you to print out this P. Sherman 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney, almost like you were going to mail a letter to it. So if you wanted to print out the exact copy of what's coming out in the compiler and stick it onto a, an envelope, that's what I'm trying to get at here. All right, guys, let's take a couple of minutes and give that a try. And thumbs up in the chat if you guys get to a point where it's working. I'm going to start preemptively writing out what I did that I think you guys might be in the same bubble of. And then I'll show you what I did to kind of trick it to be how I wanted. So that's what I have, but it's giving me an error. I'm not sure if you're not done yet. Let's see. OK. So if you look, this is of type any, right? 
So the tricky part is I've incorporated different elements. How could we make sure that even if these, even if we don't want to transform these elements, that they all match up to the criteria of being a string? You should interpolate uh, number one, dollar yep. sign one. Yep. yep. But I'll get rid of our error. But this isn't going to work quite yet. It's going to have the number like on a separate line from the yeah. address. Yeah, that's, that's messy, right? Because like whenever you guys write out an address, you're not going to want the actual like house location to be on a different line than the street address, right? We're going to want them to be on the same because that helps the postman kind of organize where it is and what house it is. So did anyone come up with a solution to kind of alleviate that? So this is what I did. And I don't think it's necessarily the right way to do it. But I can think of this. If I was an interviewer, I would be wanting to see your creative thinking skills. And whatever way you would arrive at the conclusion, I would be interested in. It's not necessarily, yes, you got the answer or no, you didn't. But I, and obviously there's going to be a lot more weight and clout if you get the right answer, the right result. But if you can be clever, then they should be able to appreciate you a little bit more. They might be able to, to kind of, I don't know, look at you from that vantage point. So I cheated. And what I did, because this is a bar, you can adjust variables. So I just said, hey, the first index at Nemo, actually, <laughs> this one, Nemo's location dot remove at index two. So I said, that number is stupid. I don't want it to be like that. And now that I've gotten rid of that, I can kind of adjust Nemo, Nemo's first index. Because if I get rid of this 42, Wallaby Way is going to become that new value. So what I can do is just say, this equals 42 Wallaby Way. Oh, sorry, I think I named it differently on my solution code that I keep looking at. Nemo's location. Yeah. I'm just gonna say, hey, get rid of 42, and then change the string of Wallaby Way to actually 42 Wallaby Way. And now I can come in and print it. And it works. So that was me cheating. But I can't help but feel like if an employer said, this is the format that I want it to be in, and this was the solution I arrived at, at least I got to a solution for one. It may not be optimized quite yet, but it does work. And that way, I, maybe I have plenty of time left over to work on the code solution. So that I could say, this is one way to do it. Will you leave me some time to keep working through and think of other ways? And I think that's going to be way more impressive when you guys are in coding interviews to have the employer say it, or the interviewer be like, wow, he did it one way and then he left enough time that he could try multiple ways and maybe you'll have multiple solutions. So that's kind of what I wanted to indoctrinate into you guys today is find Swifty solutions, write clean code, fewest lines as possible, and leave yourself time with these awesome methods to be able to one, find a solution and then have enough time to find more because that's gonna make you a standout compared to other people that are looking for the job, I think. I mean, I'm not perfect and I don't know and I'm only like starting this process, but this is the, the insight that I have for you guys and I feel like it will be helpful. All right, how do we feel about reduce? One to three in the chat. Will, thanks for the clap hands in the participants list. I'm flattered. Yeah, reduce is a trickier one, but it seems like you guys grasp these pretty well. So I'm glad. Um, sweet. Well, thanks for sticking around, guys. This was a fun lesson. I think sometimes just practicing like these conceptual skills is honestly something that we overlook quite often. We get so focused on like building a full scale project and doing such heavy framework work. And I think learning the basics like this is really critical. And so I'm glad that you got to learn this. I'm glad that you came to participate. I learned a lot from it and I hope you guys did too. Um, is there anything else that I can go over for you guys tonight out of these four methods that we touched on? 
I also feel like if nothing else, the next time you guys encounter a situation where you want to use one of these, you'll have sort of notes to come back to because of this that we did tonight. You can kind of refer back to these playgrounds and be like, oh, that's how we did it. Obviously, the use cases are going to be way more complex than what we did tonight, but they'll set you up to win a little bit better. All right, you guys. Well, I am going to close it out. I'll post the video later, too, if you want to go back through it. But you guys should have completed projects. If you don't, I'll post the solution code as well. Um, anything else that I can do for you guys tonight? Are we feeling pretty good? Quick question. Sure. Can you filter a dictionary? Yes, I wanted to do some dictionaries with you guys today. These, okay. um, these higher order functions, they can work with lots of data sets. So you can filter dictionaries, you can filter arrays of dictionaries, you can filter just arrays. Um, and that's going to be the fun, tricky part is taking these bare block based conceptual knowledges that you've learned and try to apply them on bigger scale things like dictionaries of cached objects and things like that. Um, but you definitely can do it. And that's kind of my hope too, is that you guys learn the basics for these and then you can take them and run with them going forward. Cool. All right, guys, awesome job tonight. Thanks for joining. Um, the next After Hours is Thursday night. It's with Mark Moikens. He is very well known, like super well renowned iOS dev. It's gonna have some awesome stuff to tell you guys about Swift UI. So you can look forward to that and it'll be just like really fun to get some base understanding of Swift UI and kind of the direction that app development is going into in the future now. So very cool. Alrighty, guys. Well, have a great night, and I will plan on seeing you tomorrow during class. Okay, right, guys. We'll see ya. Thanks.